I don't, I don't know what it is, but uh, it seems once something gets popular, it's in this town big time, you know? So, I don't know. I don't think we're any different than the other town. It's everywhere. I've been hearing it's just everywhere, so. Well, London's three times the size. That's one, that's one of the main things. I mean, it's just getting huge, bigger and bigger all the time, and we're getting big city problems. In, uh, it's no longer a small town, and, and people are surprised there's shootings and stuff like that. That's what comes with drugs. And it's always, it's always intertwined with drugs. Shooting it comes with money, it comes with drugs, it comes with big city problems. And big city problems are addiction. Right now, I'm a professional factory worker, I guess. I've, I've worked in London here since 1974. In about mid-90s, crystal methamphetamine made the run through the factories. It went to Ford, and then it came to us, and then, of course, guys were running around going crazy. I went through that for about, I don't know, six months, and then I couldn't sleep and couldn't eat, and I lost 40 pounds, and it was no good to get rid of that stuff. So then I went to uh, opiates, and then we went to uh, Percodan and Percocet, and, of course, those are painkillers, and I abused the hell out of them. And then they came out with this thing, and I think it was, uh, John told me later that it was invented in 1992, it's called OxyContin. Um, OxyContin is an exam example of an opioid agonist. It works, basically we have three um, pain receptors in the body, they're called mu, kappa, and delta receptors. When opioids like OxyContin bind to these receptors, they produce analgesia and they help to release pain. Oxycodone was invented in 1917. It was, to my understanding, first marketed to the public around 1980, in the early 80s. Um, that was about the same time that um, some doctors uh, decided that the previous indications for the prescription of opiate drugs was too restrictive, and uh, they basically decided that um, people who are in pain deserved access to opiate drugs, which I think is true and I certainly have no disagreement with. Uh, and they also decided that it was not their business or their issue if people took their prescriptions in other ways than they recommended they take them. And uh, therein lies why we're at where we're at. It's a time release that people would crush up and snort or inject or whatever. I never did that. I just chewed them up and ate them. And you could tell right away that these were really powerful. These were going to be really popular. And that's when the price started to go. Because at first the price was like 2 to $3 each. Now they go for like 40 or 50 bucks. I would start to do some uh, stories on homeless people. And I began to notice more and more talk of Oxy. And to be honest, I didn't really know what it was at the time. And uh, the more people I talked, the more I realized it was a growing problem. And in fact, by the time even I got to it, it, it was a huge problem on the streets of London. But not that many people had heard about it yet. When I was working foot patrol, and it would have been probably around 2000, um, is where we started finding more needles. And we were like, why is so many more needles popping up now? And and it was because of prescription drugs. And I didn't even know how they were taking it. I said, well, you know, it's a pill, what are they doing? And so I was finding they're, they're crushing it down, heating them up, saline solution and injecting them because taking them orally isn't, uh, you know, they're not getting the high that they, they used to. Uh, so that would have been around the time that I noticed that, oh, we got an issue here. Well, the patients that, uh, that I see have some combination of both addiction and physical dependency. And both of those conditions are initiated by uh, changes in the brain as a result of interaction with, uh, with these opiate substances. And by and large, those changes initiate uh, either a craving or obsessive desire or a physical uh, tendency to, to take more and more of the opiate of the opiate drug. People cope with uh, emotional pain as well as physical pain by using opioids or, or other substances that 
alter their immediate and painful perceptions. So it's really an adaptive response to uh, enormous social problems. In terms of what's the hardest to deal with right now, it's, uh, it's definitely uh, the prescription medication um, by far because the supply is so big, right? There's just there's a huge supply of, of prescription medication out there and uh, people become dealers in this stuff that aren't your typical dealers and same with the users, not your typical users. I've seen hundreds if not thousands of people in this clinic over the last 10 years and I can assure you I've seen every single type and variation of personality, person, mental disorder, and reasonably perfect mental health other than the secondary effects of addiction. Uh, there's no such thing as an addictive personality. Uh, addiction or dependence to these drugs is the simple result of, of a vulnerable brain having these drugs put in it. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of ways that people first come into contact with oxycodone drugs, and that has shifted uh, somewhat over the years. Uh, some are prescribed, them. many of them have been prescribed these drugs for pain by their doctors. Um, some get them from the guy standing next to them at work if they hurt their back and start on them that way. I know three guys personally that, they, you know, they, and these guys were not into drugs or drinking like I was. They had an operation or they, you know, broke their leg, had painkillers, and that's how they got addicted to the stuff. Uh, for many people, not all, but for many people, it's a, it's a quick addiction. So the fact that it's out there, the fact that it uh, comes legally, uh, seems to make it easy to get. And, I, I, you know, many outreach workers uh, and experts in the field have said that doctors prescribe too much. We need to stop either over-prescribing or prescribing to the wrong people or not paying attention to some of the signs, right? Because you can definitely turn a blind eye and just say, yeah, okay, here's your script. Get out of my office, right? I don't want any problems. Um, where I can look at somebody and, and after, you know, speaking to them for a few minutes about the pills that they have in their pocket that are prescribed to them in their name and know full well that they're either dealing them or uh, abusing them, right? And you, you wonder sometimes, like, how does this guy get this many pills? Like, this, this doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, some doctors I talk to say they feel they're a bit caught between the patient's demands and, and uh, you know, the concerns about oxy addiction. But, uh, you know, you'll talk to other people in the field, addiction treatment workers and advocates, and, and you know, they lay the blame pretty well squarely on doctors. I think the few doctors who were careless and the few pharmacies that were careless have kind of made it look bad for everybody. I don't think the problem of OxyContin on the street is really the fault of doctors nearly as much as it is the fault of um, uh, organized crime having access either through bribes or through theft of massive amounts of OxyContin. Yeah, they're, they're in it. Everybody's in it, right? Like I said, it, it crosses all classes right now, right? Like, you know, whether you're you're the high school student or in, in an organized motorcycle gang, um, if the if the money's there, they're they're going to get involved. And another thing, a lot of people don't realize is in in 1998, the drug company whom I won't mention was fined 800 million dollars because they didn't, they lied about the testing of OxyContin. And they paid it without even blinking an eye because that's how much money they're making. It's the world's most, most profitable drug. They, it took the place of Viagra. As far as uh, the pharmaceutical companies go, I think they are getting away with enormous profits on the backs of people who cannot stop using their product. Uh, and it's. I think it's kind of funny that pharmaceutical companies um, have really promoted this drug as being safer um, and being an ideal drug for people who may be um, overusing uh, or abusing uh, the, their opioid prescriptions. 